you see was right about uh, 15 or more years ago for Eric Hobsbawm's 80th birthday party, of course. Eric died uh, about 18 months ago. And then I suppose the previous time I was here was when I was doing my doctorate at Cambridge and uh, I, a lot of it, it was on the TUC partly actually, a lot of it was on the TUC. And I used to, I spent months and months in this building. Um, and I was just trying to work out what this room was then. I've got a feeling it might have been the library, but... No, it's the general council chamber. Was it? Well, it certainly, uh, I've yeah. got it wrong then. <laughs> so, anyway, it's very, it's very nice to be back. Um, well, I'd like to start by congratulating the TUC on, and the author, I understand is Tim, on, uh, on producing this report, which... Uh, I think is a, a very significant contribution towards what is going to be a national discussion which is going to last for many decades. So think of this as the beginning uh, rather than uh, anything else. Now, uh, I, there's a lot I agree with in this report. In fact, you know, I agree with most of what's in the report. Um, but what I wanted to do uh, by way of making my own contribution is to um, put it in a slightly different context. Because if anything, I think the report underestimates the change that's going to face not just us, but the world as a result of the extraordinary transformation that is taking place in East Asia uh, and especially, of course, uh, in China. Around about 1950, the center of the global economy was situated off the European coast in the Atlantic. Today, with the rise of East Asia and the relative decline of the West, it's now situated somewhere around the Gulf. It's projected that by 2050, or a bit earlier than that, the center of the global economy will have moved to the Indian-Chinese border. Now this is a really extraordinary story. And I think it's very important, and the report certainly recognizes this, to see this as a profound historical change which is going to continue. I mean, one of the problems I have with so much media stuff is, I mean, I was just thinking of the today, business part of the Today program, is this kind of myopic concern with the short term. Uh, you know, or China's growth rate, does it slip by 0.1% or something like that? Actually, the reality is, of course, China's going to have lots of problems, it's going to have lots of crises and so on that we haven't seen so far. But in the long run, what is going to happen is that China's rise is going to continue. And we shouldn't be so surprised about it because, you know, up until 1800, if not a bit later than that, China was the dominant economy in the world and had been for many, many centuries. And the center of the global economy had been situated in that part of the world. So if you like, this is more a return to the past or the status quo ante than it is simply something new. Now, this um, and the West supremacy over the last 200 years um, is actually historically, in some ways, to be regarded as, um, as a, 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 an odd period, as, a, as a, a deviation from what had been, for many, many centuries, the historical norm. What I'm trying to say here is really the energy, the momentum behind this transformation that is happening in East Asia is deep, is profound, and historical. Now, what is it going to mean for us? Well, I think that it means, it means something like this. You know, in the 19th century, we underestimate how much the world was required to shift its mentality because of the rise of Europe. We colonized 
we, more than most in Europe, colonize such large parts of the world. Countries were required to be either to westernize on our terms or they would be colonized. I mean, this was an extraordinary period of history. Now, if you like, we are going to witness, in my view, something I think much less brutal than that, but an important trend, which is that the process of westernization is coming to an end, historically speaking. I mean, it still exists, it's still a, a very important thing, but historically it's coming to an end and is going to be replaced increasingly what I'll, by what I'll call, for the sake of shorthand, a process of sinicization. In other words, we're going to, like just this report, we're going, to, we're going to have to try and understand what's happening, we're going to have to understand what it means for us, we're going to have to stand, understand how we relate to it, we're going to have to understand what we need to learn from it and how we ourselves need to change. And I think this is going to be a very complex and deep process. I mean, I think for Western societies, and Britain is an excellent example of this, this is going to be tough. This is going to be tough. Why? It's a mental problem. The mental problem is that we are deeply set in our ways. We have a presumption that we are the top dogs. We assume that how things work here is how things should be and how things will be elsewhere. And we still hang on to that kind of mentality. And actually, it doesn't work now. And the report, in a way, is pushing against this kind of attitude. And it's not just true in industry or the economy or uh, those kind of questions. It's also true, you think of, you know, we're in many ways in terms of the role of the West and the role of Britain and so on, increasingly beleaguered, increasingly defensive, actually, in global terms. Well, you know, we're, on, we're in decline. And yet we can't escape from our own, own, our own mentality about how to look at it. You know, you listen to the radio or television gone about the international community. What do they mean by the international community? And what they mean by the international community is the West. They don't mean the international community at all. They just mean a slice of the international community, the West, 15% of the world's population. So these categories, these ways of thinking are a tremendous problem for us because we have to think in very different terms. And this is an enormous challenge which is set out in the report in a certain kind of limited way because the questions that are being addressed are, are, are relatively limited. And I think this is, this is it's very important to understand it in these terms. And if you ask me, well, can we succeed in shifting and responding and so on? Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's going to be very difficult. I mean, of course we're going to respond in some degree. Of course we're going to learn in some degree. But are we going to be able to shift enough? This is very, very tough. I mean, this is, a, this is not a question just for this year or next year or the next decade. This is a question for the whole of this century, uh, if not uh, longer. Now, um, I, 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 having said that, of course, there has been a very big shift in uh, a limited but significant shift in attitudes uh, in this country. And I wanted to add to... Tim's points in the report, uh, three other thoughts um, for uh, what the rise of China in particular means. I mean, China is so obviously the decisive question for us rather than the other tigers, even though, you know, uh, uh, they are, uh, we can learn from those as well. Uh, and there are three questions I wanted to mention to you in this context. The first is education. If there's one thing that actually the report tends to neglect its, its school education. It's very good on languages, it's very good on the need to learn Mandarin. But you'll be aware of the OECD report recently issued, the PISA report on the performance of 15-year-olds in the, one of these global surveys in reading, science, and maths. And uh, for the second time running, the last time was at the end of 2011, the Shanghai schools uh, outperformed performed everyone, including in East Asia and uh, did extraordinarily well. Now, what is all that about? How do we explain it? Can we learn something from it? And one of the things I've found I'd be very pleased about, actually, is there has been, it has led to something of a debate here about what we can learn. And credit where credit is due, the government actually is arranging for quite a few teachers in Shanghai to come over and, uh, for some kind of exchange uh, uh, and so on. And I think that 
actually what it's about, it, I'll give you, you know, very briefly, what I think it's about is two things. One, yeah, it's important to recognize that the Shanghai schools have made some very important educational reforms uh, based on uh, new kinds of methods. Uh, I mean, you know, there's a sort of tendency to think of all East edu Asian education as rote learning and memory and all that kind of thing, which is not true in, in Shanghai. And the other thing, which is much more difficult and is much more elusive for us, is this. Shall I tell you why the Chinese do well at education? It's because the Chinese parent is deeply committed to the importance of education. Whether they're poor or whether they're middle class, there is a deep sense lodged in history, lodged in Chinese country, culture, of the importance of education. And in that, it is profoundly different from our country because I think, by and large, the British mentality and I'm talking about the mentality across the whole population, is different. It's a problem. We don't really believe in education. We don't really put it. We, I know we say education, 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 but that's politicians speak. There's a much deeper cultural problem. And that is one thing that we need. You know, we can't just learn from how they do it. We have to think now, listen, how do we create in the population, in the psyche of the British, a different attitude? towards the place of education in society. Secondly, uh, I mean, it's been an interesting shift this year, I think, in the government's attitude on China. I mean, this isn't mentioned, but, um, but uh, you know, Hawaii, its attitude in Huawei has been very good, I think, much better than the Americans. Um, nuclear power, um, uh, 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 maybe high-speed rail, uh, of course, they're anxious to get the RMB, the RMB, uh, the city playing a, a big role. But I think there has been a distinctive shift, and that it's important for us uh, to recognise that. Well, my last point is this, because uh, Linda quite rightly is uh, beginning to uh, wag her finger uh, more seriously in my direction, um, and that is, what can we learn from the Chinese state? It's not just about policy. It's not just about intervention, which the report I think is very good on but it's something I think deeper than that. and that is the Chinese state is a remarkably competent institution I mean we always go on about China in terms of democratic rights and so on and I don't want to get into that debate but it's obviously significant although too often we use that as a reason not to think about China in a more holistic way but the point is this that the Chinese state is far more competent institution, in my view, especially given it's only a developing country, a relatively poor country, it's a far more competent than any Western state. Now, we need to pause because actually, in the future, we have got so much to learn from this institution, for its, from its meritocracy, from the way people are appointed, and so on. Yes, sure, there's a lot of corruption and problems like that, but the basic competence of the Chinese state is something from which we will in the future learn. Thank you very much.